How are you? I'm doing great. How was your trip in? Perfect. Not bad, huh? Great weather. You know, everybody, I talk to people all the time, and I'm like, hey, tell me about this guy. And, you know, you always get mixed reports. You are the unanimous nice guy. Everybody says, oh, you're going to love Ernie. Ernie's a great guy. Who said that? I, don't, I can't remember, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's all the guys down in the clubhouse, Clayton <laughs> McCullough and all those guys, Dave Pano. So talk to me about this. You come out here. I don't know how many appearances you do over the course of a year, maybe a you know, handful. But what is it like when you come into a place where it's in a, Blue, a Blue Jays affiliate and they remember you? You're the guy with the big swing. You drop to the knee and you play. Oh, you even remember that. That's amazing. <laughs> do you remember the 10 home run game? Of course I do. I hit three of them. You did. I was at that game. Is that right? Absolutely. It's amazing how many people tell me they were at that game. <laughs> and there weren't many people at that game. But no, I you know, I remember that game because I just thought to myself I was a little kid at the time and I was like, This is like the greatest thing ever. Yeah. Every game must be like this, but not the case. Yeah, that's it goes back quite a few years. What was that? Eighty seven, I believe it was. It was pretty yeah, I was a teenager. Young fellow. That, that record still stands to yes, this it does. day. So I mean that that's hard to do to hit ten home runs by one team mm-hmm. in a single game. Talk, can you talk about that night? I mean, what was it in the water? There was just something that just... Did you guys in the dugout look at each other and say, wow, we're on to something special? No, uh, there was nothing like that. Uh, to be quite honest, we, we just knew that it was a blowout. and um, For some reason, I, I was seeing the ball well at that time. and uh, The pitcher, whenever he made the mistake, a lot of times you'll foul those pitches off. And uh, at this point in time, that that night I didn't follow him off. I was able to find him, hit him over the fence. Yeah, no kidding. So, that was something else. Just uh, one of the one of those things. You were a part of the Blue Jays in a great era. I mean, you were there for the first American League East pennant. You were there for the second one. I mean, can you talk to me about the first one? I talked to George Bell, and I got some of it. Can you talk to me about the fact that that was a really big moment in Blue Jays history? You finally got over the hump. Well, I think the fact that. You know, people ask me, what do you remember the most about the Blue Jays? And I do remember that year the best yeah. because uh, being a part of it since the inception in 77, you know, I saw the growing pains that we had gone through. We had players that were developing at the major league level, guys that should have been down playing in the minor leagues. They were learning the game yeah. at the big league level. And, of course, when you're going against all-star players, you know, you kind of get your 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 stuff handed to you you know and and uh we did but uh we kept getting better and we we had a feeling that well once bobby cox took over as a manager it was a totally different feel in the clubhouse it was you know we're not going to try to lose 100 games this year it's like we're going to win 80 games this year you know it's just just some little small words like that just changed the whole atmosphere of the team yeah and uh, we saw the team coming together in 1984. We had uh, that was the year the Tigers. They were fantastic they got that off year. To yeah. a tremendous start, 35 and three or something mm-hmm. like that. But come August, we were still in the race with them, and uh, we just didn't have a closer at that time, you know. And so uh, Pat Gillick and, and Beeston, they went out and acquired Bill Cottle and Gary Lavelle, and they thought that that was going to be our closers. Little did they know that. The closer that we got from Texas Rangers, Tom, Tom Hankey, yeah. was a man that put us over the hump. And we finally had a closer to close out games in 85. And, um, you know, it was a battle all the way through in, in that final series against the Yankees. Remember George I Bell do. making that final catch <laughs> and was winning it on that Saturday night. So uh, and then the following day, Phil Necro got his 300th win in the major leagues. How about that? You know, you are... For me, and I'm 39 now, and I remember sitting in the $4 cheap seats behind George Bell out in left field. And, you know, I think to myself, for me as a child, that era of Blue Jays baseball might remain still one of the best. I mean, the Blue Jays have been around 40 years. They've had some good teams, 92, 93. But I think for me, there was a little more pride in watching you guys go from the outhouse to the penthouse. And, I mean, you guys played some pretty good teams. I mean, you guys got, what, Kansas City which was a fantastic baseball yeah. team. Front-end pitching, big bats, George Brett. They had a fantastic closer. I mean, uh, but yet you guys competed. There was something in the clubhouse that kept things going. We did compete. It was, it was a, the chemistry on the team was, was outstanding. Uh, we all wanted to win. And I guess that, uh, and we had each other's back. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, chemistry doesn't mean a lot. Well, I, I say, bull crap. That yeah. means an awful lot. Uh, you know, you want teammates 
that are that can go out and do the job, do what they're asked to do. You know, hit behind a runner, put down a sacrifice bunt, whatever it takes to win. I mean, it's an you know it, it's a it's a team sport that's built with individual stats, but yet it, when you put a team together, those individual stats really doesn't mean that much. Yeah. But yet you look at the end of the year, you win, and that's because you do all the little things that's necessary to win. What is it like to platoon? I don't know if I see platooning the way that I saw it back when, for instance, you and Buck were together, Garth and Kelly were playing the hot corner. I mean, what was that like? Was there a special relationship between you two? Was it competitive? How did that all come to be? No, it was, uh, you know, naturally I wanted to catch all the time. Buck wanted to catch all the time. But then you look at it and you say, well, let's look at it on a positive way that by platooning, maybe I'm saving my knees a little bit more. Now maybe I have a a longer career as, as as a catcher. And so I tried to look at it that way, and, and yeah, there was constant communications between Buck and I, and because uh, during the course of the game, you know, if they changed pitchers and we were losing, I was going to come into the game, and or vice versa, Buck was going to come into yeah. the game. So, uh, but we also talked about our pitching staff. You know, we talked about them an awful lot, and what they what they were able to get over the plate at the time, and what was working for them, what wasn't working for them. So there was a constant communication. And actually, I said Kelly and Garth when it was actually Rance Mullenix. That's and right. Garth. It was Rance and Garth. <laughs> Who had the worst batting stance, Garth Orge or Jesse Barfield? I mean, those guys had two pretty unorthodox swings. Jesse, all you saw was his butt. And Garth, I don't even know how he came to be with that swing. <laughs> no, I would say Garth had the worst batting stance, but he, you know, it was effective for him. Uh-huh. You know, and and even now working in the minor leagues with the Phillies that I'm doing now, you know, I, I you know, working with the catchers and working with hitters, I said I don't care how you do it, just as long as you get it done. Yeah. You know, as long as it works for you and you're accomplishing and you're, you know, you're getting better. So it, that that stance worked for Garth and. Huh. The know, way it goes, huh? The way it goes. I mean, I wouldn't teach everyone to go on a back knee the way I hit the <laughs> ball either, but it worked for me. It did work for yeah. you. Uh, Ernie Witt joining us here on the Team 1040 for a couple more minutes. Uh, let me switch to the Canadian National Baseball Program. Okay. You, of course, the manager of that program. This is a, It comes under scrutiny, the National Baseball Program, because there's flashes of brilliance, like the Pan Am Games, and you know we look around the major league levels, and it's littered with Canadians now. But then there's moments like the WBC. Where do you go when it comes to the glass half full, the glass half empty approach? Do you, as a manager, try to dissect it and say, oh, "Boy, we got to get better at this," or do you say, "Hey, we've already come so far in this regard"? No, I, I get I my approach is Canada has tremendous ball players if they all play. Hmm. But let me put it right there. How do you extract them? How do you get them to play? That's I mean that's their choice. Yeah. I mean they choose not to come and play. I mean. You tell me I wouldn't want a Ryan Dempster as a starter on the mound. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, there's some guys that have injuries that, you know, they they just can't do it. But if we brought all the players that are playing at the big league level, we can compete with any team. But when you don't, you know, we don't have the depth that some of the other countries have. Mm-hmm. So when you lose a player, or he chooses not to come and play, then that that hurts us because now we're going down a level. Where other teams, well, I, you know, I mean, Dominican, you know, United States. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, they've got players that they can pull from. And, yeah. And, and they're just as good as players. Do you feel an obligation to call these players? Like, have you ever called a Ryan Dempster or a Jeff Francis? Well, we've, and... we've, we've, we've talked to them all the time. Yeah. You know, and again, it, it's I've, I've always been under the belief is that I don't want to beg a player to come and play. That's their decision. Yeah. I want players that's going to be on the team that's all in. I mean, if there's any doubt in their mind that they don't want to be there, I don't want them on the team. Yeah. That's just the way I am. Who came and approached you and said, hey, do you want to manage Canada's baseball program? Kevin Breon, who was a scout with the, yeah. the Blue Jays. Uh, this goes back to 1999. Um, he approached me and asked if I'd be an in- interested in managing, and I said, well, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Uh-huh. You know, And uh, so that's, that's how it started. And... Uh, Kevin moved on and became a scout at uh, with the Jays, and Greg Hamilton took over. And Greg says uh, he he he's wanted me every year. So uh, after this past WBC, I asked. I said, "You want me to resign?" I said, <laughs> "No." You know, and I you know, but I was being honest. I mean, we've got a lot of good qualified Canadian coaches now that could come and 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 do the job. And 
But uh, Greg is happy, I guess, with where we're at and what we've, you know, we have come a long ways. And I enjoy doing it. I yeah. love doing it. I love to compete. And, uh, the, you know, working with the Canadian kids, uh, they'll run through a brick wall for you. Yeah, they will. Uh, you know, and it's just, uh, you, my job is just to try to put them in, you know, areas where they're going to be successful. Do you feel that perhaps you are a great bridge between the Blue Jays organization and Baseball Canada? Because let's face it, Baseball Canada needs that relationship. And I would assume from a PR perspective, the Blue Jays need to be kind of in, in bed, so to speak, with Baseball Canada. You seem to be the guy that's got both ears of both organizations. I don't know whether I have the ears of the Blue Jay organization. Do you not? I, don't, I don't think so. You don't got any clout over there? <laughs> no. Those, 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 remember, I got fired in 08. Well, that's <laughs> okay. Oh, they're bringing everybody back. I went to spring training. Uh, I couldn't believe who was out there. Yeah, I know. There, everyone's there. But uh, I'm happy where I'm at. Uh, you know, since 08, things have changed around a little bit over there. But, uh, uh, you know, the Blue Jays have been very supportive to Team Canada. Yeah, they and, have. Uh, you know, we can actually, you know, we take a lot of their players, too, not only in the WBC, but all the other tournaments that we go to. And yeah. They're, they're very good with that, and they're, they're very big supporters of it. So... It, it would be difficult without the support of the Jays. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what. I could talk to you the whole hour. And believe me, if I had a better show, I would. But I'll get you in back in there. I know you got to shake some hands, kiss some okay. babies, take some photos. But Absolutely. thanks for coming out today. Thank it was you. a thrill to Enjoyed meet you. It. It's great to be here. All right. There he is. Ernie Witt, former Toronto Blue Jay great, the current manager who better not resign from Baseball Canada.